Let's go. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the CrickCast. Today, we have another very special guest and another very special episode. Um, I mean, yeah, uh, we have Yimisha um, Mukherjee on. Sorry if I butchered the name. No, no, <laughs> um, you did great. <laughs> yeah, you so it. if you would like to introduce yourself a bit. Hi, my name is Namisha Mukherjee. I'm a writer, producer, director. Um, I'm the founder of the production company Shot Glass Productions. Uh, my breakout film was a feature called 65 Red Roses. It was selected by Oprah Winfrey for her documentary club on OWN. Um, that film told the story about a 23-year-old girl who was on the wait list for a double lung transplant. Uh, when kids are little, they can't pronounce cystic fibrosis, so they learn to say 65 roses instead. So that's where the title of the film came about. And that film became a huge launching point for me, um, but it also had a it really propelled me as a storyteller in terms of what I wanted to do with my career because that film had a huge social impact. It ended up tripling organ donation rates in the whole province that I live in. I'm a Canadian. And when it was aired in the U S with, uh, with the support of Oprah Winfrey, it ended up having a huge impact there as well as in, in addition to being internationally screening screening. So, uh, yeah, that launched my career and I haven't looked back since. Wow. We, that's perfect. Like we should uh, really do a movie night with that. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Happy to see like movies change the world around us. Yeah. 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 It's uh, I think that that's the whole reason why, you know, I mean, even for you, right? Why you work in a creative field is you want to have an impact, a positive impact yeah. on the world. Okay. Well, uh, perfect. Uh, thanks for coming in by the way. Uh, it's yeah. a pleasure to have you here. Uh, so yeah, for our listeners, uh, if you didn't know, if you didn't get the gist of it, uh, we're going to talk about film and more specifically film for the people. Uh, we're going to touch on many different subjects that surround film, like woman in film. Uh, we're going to do a little interview here to get a better feel for our guests. So yeah, I hope you enjoy this episode. And right now, we're going to go to our ad break uh, to get that ad revenue. As you may know, we don't actually use the money ourselves. We donate it to the uh, charity of the week. So none of the money goes to us. So don't worry. These all for a good cause. Uh, so yeah, see you back after the ad break. Welcome back from that little ad. Thanks again to Anchor for being our platform and allowing us to do this. Um, and we'd like to start, start off with a very um, important uh, topic, which is women in film. Um, I think we've seen over the years that it's kind of, uh, well, it's not really represented as it should be. And a lot of the time there's not the same opportunities. Uh, so I just kind of like to know what's what's your opinion and what it's been like for you as a woman in the film industry. Yeah, it's a it's a really good question. I mean, I think as a female director as well as being a, you know, a, a minority, a visible minority director, it's, you know, I feel very grateful that I'm working now. Um and I I really mean that because I've been able to actually see in the last five years, uh, you know, a small shift of inclusivity within, you know, the, the, the bigger system, the bigger film industry and entertainment machine. Um, it's very, it's been very small though, and it's been a long time coming, but yeah. you know, I think like what I, you know, right now, when you look at, you know, even the Oscar list and you have someone like Chloe Zhao who, um, Nomadland, I think what, what a film like that really teaches people is that, you know, just because you're a woman and just because you're a diverse woman doesn't mean you can't tell any kind of story. You know, she's now working on huge, big budget productions. Um, so I think that's what's actually really exciting because I think the conversation initially was just sort of like females telling female driven stories or females, uh, you know, diverse people telling diverse stories. But now, you know, what we're kind of seeing is, is that as a storyteller, teller, you want to be able to tell all kinds of stories. 
Um, and we're starting to see people getting really elevated and, and getting those international platforms, which is really exciting. So uh, I think for m myself and in my own career, you know, where I started um, and feeling really renegated to being an indie film and just in, um, you know, documentary film and not feeling like I could ever move up and have a sustainable career. It's been exciting to see that there's some small opportunities that have been given um, to enable me to at least show what I can do. And then because I keep getting hired back, it's proving like, you know, I deserve to be here. I have the ability and skills and talent to actually, you know, direct large scale productions as well as independent films. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's really just a case of what I think, like, there's no reason why women shouldn't be put at the same standard. And as you said, like, it's kind of been going very slowly, but I mean, now we can kind of see the difference and the impact in the industry. There's, I, f I feel like there's been a lot more female directed and produced films and it's just kind of um, blowing up a bit. Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, there was a kind of a public shaming <laughs> that sort of yeah. occurred. And then unfortunately that it tends to, that's how it tends to go is that until, you know, and there's, there's definitely been some really courageous people at the forefront of that who, you know, weren't afraid to call call out you know hollywood call out the industry for not um not allowing us to be competitive like to me it's really there's you know nobody's taking jobs from anybody it's just it's like anything um you want to show that you are there you're competing for these jobs you're you know there's nothing anyone should be afraid of if they're great at their job the best person will always get hired and the best person will always get hired back because at the end of the day people want to work with that you know, people who have vision and who have the skill, you have the talent. Um, so really, it's just been, you know, it kind of explaining to people like, you know, what, why, why is there this fear against just opening up the competition, you know? Yeah, if, yeah, if, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> there's nothing to be afraid of. If you're good, you're good. <laughs> yeah, but like, yeah, just like Hollywood in general isn't uh, what to call it a novel area of work it's usually like filled with sharks and people who want to bring you down people who are on positions of power and don't want to get down so i think that's yeah. a, a pretty big problem that you, maybe you can tell us about if you have like any experiences with that and yeah yeah, yeah for sure and i think like you know i think that this misconception is that things are changing so fast but you know You're absolutely right, uh, and and I think the thing is the people who are in power um, are holding on to that power very tightly. And and I think recently in a 60 Minutes interview, they were talking about racism in the military, and and someone was saying, you know, a duck will always hire another duck. So you you definitely witness that. I you know I'm on I'm on a project right now, um, and they you know I I I find that on the calls no one will say my name because my name is an ethnic name and it's difficult to say, and they'll just avoid you know, saying my name, they won't include me, it, you know, in the emails, like it's, it's really, and I'm a, I'm a producer on the project and it's, um, you, you encounter yeah. it in many small ways and big ways. Um, and you realize, you know, it's also essentially when you're always pitching to only, you know, people who are white, um, often mostly still primarily men. And, you know, when you're talking about being a storyteller and trying to tell any kind of story, if you have a story that, you know, they just can't relate to, there's this mis, I think some, often they think then it's not going to be relatable and it's not going to be able to find an audience. And yeah. that's true. We've, we've seen that, you know, women, women watch movies, <laughs> women consume <laughs> yeah. television. Uh, you know, you're, again, it's like, it seems like a very, it seems like a misstep because if you want, if you want it to be successful, financially successful, why would you limit your audience? your audience or your consumer, your potential consumer ship as well. So it's, um, it's, it's, con it is a con it's constant, it's constantly there. Um, but, you know, I think that what I feel now is more empowered to actually keep pushing through and keep creating my own independent projects as well as working for hire. And I think that that's, you know, helped me uh, not lose hope because I feel like I have an outlet and I keep working on my own, stuff as I'm working on, you know, other productions. And I am seeing, you know, I've worked a lot with Disney and, you know, I'm seeing very diverse casts. I'm seeing that reflected in the crews as well. And these are top-notch shows. So it's not like the quality is, you know, 
being yeah. sacrificed in, in on any in any way, you know. And I think that again, um, it's only happened recently. It's only happened in the last couple of years. So uh, it shows you how uh, it's a big deal, but there's a long way to go. Yeah, yeah. definitely. It's like. Uh, yeah, that was one of the points that we were going to bring up, but I think you uh, explained it perfectly, uh, more than we could add to. So, yeah, uh, thanks for that. Uh, next up, we have... Uh, there's been a really big difference between Hollywood movies and more local and less blockbuster -y films, which is just like the indie film scenario. And what are your thoughts on that? Like, are, is the difference too big? Uh, is it even there? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think to some degree, it's like, you want to, you want to believe it's different. But you know, I, I, what we're seeing is like, when you're making an independent film, you still have to, you still have to go out and raise the funds the raise the money hmm. um, through either private investors or through, you know, we have public, um, public grants and funds in Canada. And, you know, this, this, the conversation is still the same as what, you know, what we're seeing happening in Hollywood right now, which is like, who are those gatekeepers? Why are they giving the same people? Why are the same people getting off, getting the opportunity to tell the same kind of stories over and over again? How do you, out, how do you outsmart that system is as much a challenge on the local level to some degree, I would say. Um, It's not easier. Uh, I think for a, a lot of those reasons why documentary filmmaking was sort of my first step in was because I felt like I didn't have to ask permission and you didn't need a lot of money. And I think we're seeing that right now in like, you know, from YouTube videos and streaming contents and people who are creating their own channels and and they're finding an audience. And a lot of the times it's diverse voices and young voices that are actually getting the largest viewerships on these platforms. And it's because they have their pulse on what's actually going on. They have something original and fresh to say, and people will find, people will find them, you know, because their people are hungry for that. And so yeah. I think that right now is a really interest. It's an interesting time of the influence of power and where is the most original content coming from? Um, you know, I think that, uh, Yeah, it's, it, you know, with Insecure and Ice Array, like, you know, having a, a series first, uh, you know, a web series and then moving into working on Insecure and now working with HBO and having huge contracts with Warner Brothers. Like you see, like, you know, they're, they're looking for those new voices and they're going to all those places to find it. So those those are not you would normally think are small, independent projects that people are working on kind of in isolation from the system but they're using that as a stepping stone to to raise their career so it's um it's kind of a little bit of the wild west right now it feels like yeah. <laughs> so you know and everyone's searching for content and it's so competitive and so yeah. everybody wants to find that new thing and it can come from anywhere and so i think like in that there's a lot of opportunities but uh you know who are the people who are holding Uh, you know the keys. Uh, those those people are kind of still the same people. So it's it's an interesting time. Yeah, yeah sure. it's kind of like there's a gray area between kind of the Hollywood blockbuster scene and the indie scene, especially with like so much um, different type of content kind of rising, as you mentioned, like streaming platforms and YouTube and all these different things kind of offer a different type of. Uh, viewership which has come become very global and yeah. very very like streamed and used it's kind of the new the new tv in a way yeah yeah and you're also finding like people who were working in independent film like taika watiti like are now doing huge blockbuster films like yeah and why why are they seeking out those voices because they want something new right yeah um they're not just giving it to the same people, uh, you know, and I think it's because they, you know, like they, why did they take so long? <laughs> I would say they were risk averse <laughs> probably yeah. because, you know, Taika's work has like been brilliant for so long, but at the same time, it's exciting because you're seeing that those people are succeeding and they're succeeding on this massive level. And so clearly there's a hunger for, for these kinds of talents. So they're, they're looking outside the box, which is good. Uh, so yeah, I kind of wanted to touch a bit on your documentaries and your work, uh, which I, I saw 
well, I haven't seen them yet, but <laughs> I saw the the main kind of concepts of 65 Red Roses, uh, Blood Relatives. Um, I saw your latest project as well, um, with which you produced, uh, and also your Disney shows. So I was kind of curious with how that has shaped uh, your view of the world and film in itself. It's a good question. I, I mean, documentary, you know, I never thought I was going to be a documentary filmmaker. Um, I always thought I wanted to, you know, you always dream of working for Hollywood and that's where you, you, you're, you set your goals. But yeah. I was lucky enough to be mentored by a filmmaker named John Zaritsky, who had won an Oscar for his documentary, Just Another Missing Kid, in, uh, in 1983. And John had um, really, like, he really helped shape me as a storyteller because he kind of sh showed me how documentaries are essentially, you know, stru structurally observational documentaries or cinema verite documentaries are essentially very much structured, or the way I structure them is like narrative films. Um, and like what we're seeing right now, which is really interesting and with the rise, you know, the rise and fall of reality TV and then, you know, this um, idea of working with non-actors is I think now more than ever, people have a really good BS radar and they want they want something that's real. They want something that's truthful. They want something that's authentic and they can tell when it doesn't feel that way. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think because I spent so long working in documentary and working with with real people and and being allowed, you know, being privileged enough to be able to to follow them in their lives, often in very challenging circumstances, um, it teaches you really quickly how to gain trust, um, how to be a good listener, and what are the most important aspects of storytelling. How do you set up something so that you know, in documentary, you're constantly having to think about where the story could go because the story could go in so many different directions. And yeah. oftentimes people think that that just means following with a camera, but actually that means constantly thinking of a story and structure because if you don't ask the right question at the right time, um, you essentially can't follow through with that storyline properly. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I think it was a really good training ground for me terms of developing my skills and honing my skills and and then I think the 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 tricky part was you know especially working on social impact films you know with Blood Relative going to India that that film was in direct response to 65 Red Roses because in India the situation was that you know kids had this illness called thalassemia that was totally treatable they just couldn't afford the medication i just finished making a film about someone who had cystic fibrosis which has no cure and she had, you know essentially all of the the women in that film young women in that film you know died because of it even you know there was no they had like, the best circumstances they were living in america and canada you know in canada we, we have universal health care um yeah best circumstances but worst situation <laughs> um so you know going to india and getting to see how you know and that film was also about highlighting indian people on the ground who are trying to make a difference rather than it being you know, someone from the western world coming in to save the day it was about highlighting who are the people on the ground trying to make a real difference and i think getting to go and experience people's lives in that such an intimate way um, you know, changed me as a person, but it also showed me, you know, I, in each project, I may, I've been able to see the real, uh, your real ability as a storyteller to actually create change, you know, like, it's not just something we say, it, it really has that power. Yeah, like so, no, um, it doesn't have yeah. to have so much money behind it, or no, like no. Big, big studios, like, that's the message we want to, like, get across, like, in this podcast, or just in general, right. like with our whole like brand, I dare say, uh, is right. that uh, like individual people have power. Like we work better yeah. as teams, but you individually have power. And if you decide to go yeah. out there and do things like, for example, a documentary, you really and truly do have the power to create change in this world. Yeah. You do. And I've seen it. And that's the only reason why I still work. Uh, as a filmmaker, because my very first film, you know, when we released 65 at Roses when I was 25 years old, you know, our home province. And again, when you talk about local, you know, uh, we always thought we had to go somewhere else to find a story. You know, Ava, the main subject of that film was right in our backyard. She was the same age as us. She had just been 
you know, we were 23. She had, she had to leave university because her health had deteriorated. And that film, that story, that personal struggle of a, a young woman in, in Vancouver became an internet, had an international platform and reached people internationally. Mm-hmm. And, and actually, you know, like BC had the low, British Columbia had the lowest organ donation rate in Canada. And when we, finished the film and it aired like when we were able to find out that that helped triple the organ donation rates here you realize that if one life was impacted you know that's that's enough like you know it's like if you can do that for one person give them a chance um you realize like it literally does come down to individual relationships reaching out connecting one person at a time and not being afraid to fail in the process yeah and yeah. failure is the greatest about... teacher sorry yeah no it's like I uh, completely agree like if you are afraid from failure you can never go anywhere that's just a fact of life you have to face those exactly. demons and you feel like you i think you hit on something so important which is like that sense of power because i think fail the fear of failure makes people feel powerless and yeah. the truth is you have the power and you have the power to step out as an individual, but you also have the power to choose your team and choose the people that you want to work with and and uh, and create something together. Because, you know, all these documentaries, I worked with a small but incredible group of people that really we had a shared vision and we believed in the story and we believed that it mattered. And, and that's what kept us going, you know, so that, um, and not, t- not taking no for an answer. So, yeah, I think, I think it's really, I think it's really important right now for people to feel that, that sense of empowerment. Yeah. yeah. You can, you can write your own destiny at the end of the day. You don't. And sometimes it feels like things have to be done a certain way and it's written to kind of follow those guidelines. But at the end of the day, we're the people who choose our destiny. Totally. And the more you try to make other people happy or try to fo- follow that follow a path I think like especially in film and a lot of times in creative it's like so limiting and you're not being true to yourself like I think the the way to succeed is to just like it it really is about being yourself and thinking about what matters to you and having a sense of purpose right yeah Um, in your work and intention and so like those are things I think again kind of sometimes scare people (laughs) but if you don't have intention Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you're not going to be able to tell to tell someone else's story and you won't be able to bring anything new to it because you don't you're not living with a sense of purpose. So yeah. um, I think that that's what's been great about working in documentary and then, you know, working in what's been wonderful about working on, you know, network television as an episodic director is it, it became more sustainable. But it still propelled me to understand the importance of keeping that independent voice and always staying connected to your community because, um, you don't want to get lost in that either. Yeah, definitely. I agree. So, yeah, uh, with that, I think we can move on to a, a little interview, like ask you some questions, get to know you better so our viewers know where you're coming from. And, yeah, we'll just uh, get to know you a little better. Sounds good. Our first question, I think it's the most important here in our podcasts, uh, and just take it slow. It's a big one. So <laughs> what's your favorite film ever? Oh, no. <laughs> I know. I know. That is such a hard question. Um, the first film that comes to mind is City of God. Um, Ooh. Uh, it's a, if you haven't seen it, go see it. Um, I mean, that film just, it, 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 yeah, it, it's just... <laughs> Fernando Mariah, I mean, everything in it was just, um, it just broke all the rules. It was a foreign, you know, I speak English. It was a foreign film. Nobody in it that you would know. uh, No one recognizable shot with non-actors. And yet it just grips you um, on every level. And it's such a smart uh, film with such a distinct perspective. Um, it really transports you to me it really transports you somewhere else um and has so much style uh as well so um it's 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 at it's hard to pick my favorite film but it's definitely at the top of the list 
Oh yeah, yeah. I've, I've been recommended that movie a lot of times. I should probably watch it. I think, yeah, <laughs> I think it's about time to to give it a watch. Yeah, yeah. So, you yeah. you won't regret it. Just uh, just put it on press play. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, um, after that hardball question, <laughs> um, kind of you you've kind of talked a little bit about um, the environment uh, of the film industry and how it's kind of looking nowadays. Uh, but I'm interested in knowing like what's been your personal journey through the film industry and how like the ups, the downs, what's been the most complicated parts, and so on and so on. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, just to give a quick kind of example of this, like my, I, I, I didn't know anybody in film. Like, I, I think it's one of those industries. It's really hard if you don't know someone to really know how to get there. Mm-hmm. I always liked film. I watched a lot of movies. I worked in a video rental store, which ages me, I realized, but I, um, you know, I, I loved movies. I loved all kinds of movies, but I had no idea that that, that could be a career of any kind. And when I went to the University of British Columbia, I just, I didn't have any real idea of what to do. I was just taking English courses and I stumbled on a a film program. And at the time you could apply to, to major in film production. They accepted 15 people a year. And I applied, I worked really hard on a project and I applied and I didn't get in. And the moment that I didn't get in, I knew I wanted to be a filmmaker. I, I just was un, unable to accept that no. And I spent another year just making making films and reapplied and got in. And I think that that experience has really is something I constantly come back to because that is exactly what this industry is. There's so much rejection. They're so it's so subjective. There's so many people that are telling you no all the time, and you have to be able to push through that and and ignore the noise and go. I have something to offer, and believe in that and trust that, and then actually go out and make it happen. And so I think you know I that was definitely the start. And then you know, Sixty Five Red Roses was my first film, like right out of film school, that was the film I I co-directed with my partner, Philip Lyle, um, at the time who I met in film school. And then from there, you know, you know, what would have normally been a calling card film, I was told, you know, the industry in Vancouver shut down uh, in 2009, because it's 95% of our industry here is the American productions. And, you know, the dollar changed, and all the American productions left. And so I just went out and made another documentary. Uh, I met and made Blood Relative, which, you know, did really well and got a bunch of awards and and got me a lot of, um, you know, sort of showed that I could, you know, I did it once, but it showed I could do it again. And then you find like you're constantly sort of doing it, proving it again and again, what you're capable of. And, and, you know, it was with each step sort of um, fighting my way towards, you know, trying to break into the, the bigger industry. Um, and, you know, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a long road. It did not happen fast. It's been a hustle. I'm still hustling because you're always setting your eyes on the next thing you're trying to get off the ground. But I think that first experience really kind of encapsulates what it's been like for probably the last uh, you know, I've been doing this for, yeah, 14 years. Um, so yeah, it's been, yeah. it's been a hustle. Yeah. And I, I mean, I can imagine like that, as we kind of mentioned, you, you've probably had to face adversities, whether they are kind of, um, conscious or unconscious, uh, because it's kind of, it's kind of a, a system flaw in the way that it is nowadays and or well it's changing nowadays but how it has been and i also think like what you what you said about having like been rejected i mean that kind of says a lot about you as a person and as a worker as well as kind of the industry because a lot of people might want to be like filmmakers and they can't take rejection which is something like massive, especially when you're trying to produce for yourself and do these kind of projects which express yourself. So, yeah, I mean, credit to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, anybody, anybody endeavoring on anything creative, you know, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a film, you know, you're um, there's a lot of people that are going to tell you you can't do it. Um, and why do you still go out and do it? 
right? Because, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. I, 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 I've said this before to my husband and like, you know, my parents and I said, I really, there's nothing else I can think. I'm not good at anything else. <laughs> there's nothing else I can do. There is no backup plan or other option. I really have to, this has to work because there's nothing yeah. else that I, you know, could spend my life doing because it's not a job. I think that's the other thing. It, it's not a job. It, if it, there's lots of jobs out there um, where you enjoy your weekends and you enjoy your time off and you count down the hours till you're out. Um, this yeah. isn't that. This is really your life. It's it's part of your life. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's important that you have, you have to love it. Yeah. yeah. And with film, uh, it may be a little obvious, but we need to specify what do you think is the impact of film in the world? To me, film is, you know, right now when we talk about how, what, you know, especially during the pandemic, what did people do, right? Like your, it's the way of how it was a way to connect. It was a, a there, some people would say it's escapism. You know, I think that film, film plays so many roles right now in terms of educating, in terms of creating empathy, um, in terms of enlightening, like it's, it's a very powerful tool when used the right way it can literally like, you know, what we said earlier, it can literally save a life. Yeah. Um, it can literally inspire people to change their habits, uh, whether it's become vegetarian, whether it's believe in climate change, whether it, like it, it has that power. And I put all filmmaking into that, you know, and I think document mm -hmm. it's especially exciting for me to see, you know, with, the rise of Netflix, what happened was how much people were drawn to documentaries um, and, and yeah. social impact documentaries, like really found an audience and people really want to want to care about something, you know? Um, so I think of film as like an empathy machine. Like I think if, when it's used right, it can really uh, create that feeling in people to, to really care and, and then not only care, but actually take action. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I, I just kind of want to highlight um, that you said use right, because I think that it's kind of, honestly, I don't feel like in its majority we see, well, at least mainstream, that it actually is used right. Um, but it, it's so such a powerful tool that even if just one project is good enough and it's used right, it can change a complete aspect of the world like totally yeah yeah and i also think you know like that's it's like such a chicken and egg thing because on the other hand you have so much power as a consumer I and mean, i hate calling people consumers but you have but it, in some ways it's like taking that and owning it for what it is which is that every time you click on something every time you watch something you're sending a message that this is yeah. what people want um, and for the longest time that pe like the argument was that we were just giving people what they want. Right. Mm -hmm. But what you're seeing now is there's a lot of choice out there. And so there's really no excuses. Like you can go and seek out some really mm -hmm. high quality entertainment, but also, yeah. you know, things that can educate you and open your mind and it's there and it's accessible and it's not that expensive. And, you know, the choice is up to each person individually. What do they want to watch on, you know, at the end of their day? Um, and so I think like, yeah, I think that the, it's, it goes both ways. Yeah. So if you want to click on the Creek cast, be, yeah. be welcome <laughs> or exactly. check out all of, all of your projects as well. We got to support <laughs> each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, so I was really curious to kind of go into your mentality when you chose the topics of your projects uh so how did like you decide to make these especially because i saw the men they don't seem like very spoken about projects they may be very kind of underlying issues at times and i found them very new projects that i haven't really seen ever before so what made you kind of go in those directions Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question because it's like, it takes so much of your life each time you commit to a project. So you have to really think about it before you do it. Like, I think the first thing is, is can I add something to this? Like, can I actually, um, like, will I actually elevate this work or can I take it to where it needs to get to? Um, do I want to, you know, live, breathe this story and this person's life? 
Um, I think the other driving force is always being so surprised that no one's made a film about, you know, about this person or the situation before. Um, and I think it's like, it's that distinct perspective or POV. Um, and then the last thing I think is really about with the documentaries, especially it's that it's, it's the person that I'm collaborating with. So the key subjects, why are they, why do they want to do this? And oftentimes it's the people that are so res are resistant to telling their story that I'm drawn to the most because yeah. they don't seek out the limelight in that way. Um, and then I know that they have something in them that like, seems like a secret that they just haven't been able to share. And, and that, that spark of that interest of that question of like, what is it that drives you or what is it that you're holding back? Um, kind of that it leads me and, you know, leads me to kind of start. And then it's that chemistry of, you know, that trust, like, can we trust in each other? And sometimes it doesn't work. Um, sometimes you have it at the beginning and you, you don't end up there at the end, but I never re regret it because it's like, you always learn something through the process. Um, and again, you can't control, you put so much of your, your life into these films and your heart into it. And you, you end up with like all kinds of different reviews and reactions, uh, yeah. to your stories and you can't control that at all. And so, you know, I think that, that, that's definitely there at the beginning too. Like, uh, would I do this if it failed? And if the answer is still yes, <laughs> cause it's like, <laughs> I'm interested. I am yeah, interested a question to sort of ask yourself, but it's like, you really have, like, I can't guarantee it'll be a success, right? Yeah, um, and so it's, you have to sort of reckon with that early on. Like, is it still worth it? Is it worth trying? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, because I'm going to learn something here and I'm going to see something I've never seen before. Um, and then I, I, I use that even with my scripted work. Um, yeah, it's like, is there something new here? Wow, great. So, now we have a, another big question. Uh, I think maybe it was answered previously, but we'll see. Uh, how has film changed your life? What major impact has the medium had on your way of living? You know, film. I, films to me like are like stories are like friends. Like I think it's films have made me feel less alone. Um, and I think that that's, you know, and again, when you, you create, you know, for myself craving that connection, I think films have enabled me to feel connected to worlds and places that I, you know, might never actually get to see myself, you know? Um, but I feel like I have a sense of them. I feel like I, you know, people that I never actually got to meet, I feel, I feel the impact of them in, in my life in terms of inspiring me to you know go on when you know you think oh hope is lost or um or you know shaking me out of complacency uh you know that's that's what friends do <laughs> they, <laughs> they give you hard reality checks sometimes and they give you support they yeah. make you cry they make you laugh you know i think like it's um i grew up you know i had i grew up my my parents were immigrants that came to canada from india and my mom always loved films And I think that, you know, early on feeling a connection to not, you know, I never, I didn't grow up in India. I grew up in Canada and I always felt very disconnected from my family in India because we just never got to see them very much. And, you know, I think originally, you know, seeing films, uh, you know, helped me feel a sense of, of, of understanding of where I came from and, And again, the world, a, a world that I hadn't seen, you know, India, I'd never been to India, but I could get a sense of it from these, from these movies. Um, so I think like the, yeah, I think it, you know, it's, it's, it's had a huge impact on my life because I've dedicated my life to making films and then to trying to make films that can do, you know, elicit this sort of response from the viewer, the same, you know, responses that I receive. So it's like very give and take, right? Because I think, you know, Uh, they're so, you know, I, I admire anyone who has the guts to go and make a film. You know, yeah, it takes so much yeah. work even to make a bad film. Like you realize that it takes so much work uh, that, you know, I, I, uh, no, I, I never feel like it's, it's not worth it watching something, you know, even if it's five minutes of it, at least I, you, I, I always feel like if someone put something into it and put it out there, you know, 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, like anyone can make a film, uh, and it really does take a lot. I don't know if you know the film uh, Who Killed Captain Alex? Do any of you know? <laughs> well, it's a a really great film. Like, if there's anyone in the audience right now listening that knows the film, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, it, it was a, a film uh, that was... I think uh, in like Sudan or a, a really poor country in Africa that uh-huh. uh, simply like have like two dollars as the entire money, but the entire village came together to make this <laughs> awesome film, which is genuinely good. Like it's not like ah ha ha, it's so bad, it's good. No, it's genuinely great. Oh, awesome. it's really inspirational because they didn't have like a cent to do the thing like they they just like borrow the camera uh had a script put together and it's just people having fun and making a a great film <laughs> so i think that's a a really big lesson that anyone can get out of it that it really doesn't matter if you want to make a big film or a small film uh, as long as you have people or that actually believe in your story, that yeah. believe in you and the idea that you're creating, like you can make it. It's 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 yeah possible. And I also think like kind of the the most like essential part of it is ultimately the passion for it because. Uh, I just looked up who killed Captain Alex. And as you mentioned, like, it's kind of a whole village coming together and it's passion, it's entertainment. And for them, it's probably a great time as well as it realistically should be for any creator. Um, And everybody has their own kind of motivation, which kind of brings me back to a question that I wanted to ask you while listening to your answer. Um, was Blood Relatives the first time you went to India? Uh, it was the, you know, it was the first time I'd been back in like 20 years. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, it, uh, like not as like a vacation, like I, I, I went when I was five and then I went again when I was 25. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, and so it was the first time that I actually spent like an extended period of time there um, and didn't just see like, you know, the sites um, yeah. where I actually really like lived, like lived there. Like um, you took it in. Yeah. Like really took it in and took it in all sides of it because we were filming with some very um, impoverished people Mm-hmm. Uh, so you are seeing sort of everything uh, of Mumbai and we centralized it in Mumbai. The film is in Mumbai. It takes place in Mumbai. So it was like a very much like a, I actually got to know that city um, yeah. in a way that I just had never thought I would ever, I would ne- I don't think I would have ever been brave enough to do it without the camera. I think the camera gave me the mm-hmm. ability to go do that, to go live there and actually, you know, I'm not speaking any other language other than English. <laughs> like yeah. actually, so do that, like, you know, just go be immersed in in a country and a culture that I felt I wish I had a, a stronger connection to. But at that time, I didn't. Yeah, well, yeah, because I mean, I, I, I find it very interesting when people kind of connect to their, uh, well, to their history, to their family history or personal history. And it's it's very interesting that you really hadn't known India. And in this project, it kind of also gave you a personal kind of goal, I guess. And yeah, very interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally, totally, yeah. Yeah, it um, was a, yeah, one of the best experiences. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> so, <It was> hard. <laughs> <laughs> so ultimately, um, this also kind of makes me wonder what, influence you have in your personal and professional life um kind of branches out into your family how close they are to you and how that kind of impacts you as well uh so yeah yeah i, I mean I, this is the thing i would say is it's, it's been a family affair um, because you know my parents um you know to their credit 
you know, helped me buy my first camera when I got, didn't get into the film production program. Um, mm-hmm. They understood that this was something I wasn't, you know, I, what, my parents were very much like, you can do anything, be anything, but you have to go do it well. <laughs> you know, there, you cannot not succeed at it. And, you know, that pressure alone, like it wasn't like they were saying, go be a doctor. They were like, no, you can do anything. Just you really got to be the best at it. And so it was like, okay. Um, And so, you know, and I think because my mom had always loved movies, um, she's always understood, like she's really understood it in a way and and making them a part of the process, like not just sharing with them the successes, but telling them about the failures and explaining to them what the process really is that's involved so that they get it. Um, Because I think it's for, for a lot of people, it's very foreign. They don't really know how it works. Um, and it, it, the mis, you know, the misconception is, is just people be, hit it big overnight and no, yeah. it's years and years and years to get to that point. So, and then my husband, I met at film, in film school. Um, and so, you know, we, we created shock class productions together. We've been working together for over 10 years. Um, he shot an edited blood relative, like he, yeah. So it's, uh, you know, he's a director as well. So we've got two directors in the family. And then my son, uh, when my son Kian was born, we shot a film about it uh, for it's Hot Docs. Is a, it's the biggest documentary festival in North America. And it, mm. they commissioned us to do a short film. And we, we did it about the birth of our son. <laughs> so we were editing this film, like, with a newborn baby and had this insane deadline. And But now I have this movie that... You know, I, I don't think I would have ever made it for the yeah. fact I had a deadline. Um, so, you know, I think like, um, yeah, it, it's so personal. You know, it's not, uh, yeah, it's it's a per, it's a very personal thing. And like like I was saying before, it's not um, it's not a clear in and out kind of job. It's a job that just is constantly sort of yeah happening. So um, yeah, I'm really grateful because I have very understanding family and very supportive friend circle who, you know, have been able to understand, you know, when I've had to drop, you you miss really important life moments because you're off making a film and you can't be there, you know, you can't be there like you want to. And so it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's been a lot of sacrifices for a lot of people uh, in my life, but they've, they've understood what the point is and they've understood why I'm doing it. And, and I think that helps. Yeah. Like, and they've seen me not give up. I think they've seen me struggle and not give up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's part of it. Uh, you really can't get anywhere in this world without sacrificing. So it's yeah. really, it's really important to have people who are willing to help no matter what. Not yeah. Really, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now like skipping over some questions to, to wrap things up. Uh, we want to know here, personally and exclusively in the Creekcast, <laughs> three future goals in your work. Oh yeah. Okay. So I um. Well, I definitely want you know I'm in the process of getting a scripted feature um, off the ground. We've been working on the script, and I'm really excited about it. So there's that. Um, I have been developing a series. Uh, called New Country with Mark, my husband, and we've been working on that really hard, and we've got some exciting things happening. So we're, uh, yeah, so we have to just push that forward. And then, you know, I want to, I want to direct, you know, the pilot or the, I want to direct a mini series, you know, on the scale of, you know, these huge, amazing, you know productions that we're seeing, you know, like Queen's Gambit and you're seeing like, you know, The Crown and you're seeing these, you know, film budgets applied to television, but you get to do it, you know, you get to tell that story in like five or six episodes, right? As before you would only see them in two or three episodes. But I think for me, I would really love to see something like, like Mugliasm or about the Mughal Empire. I think we get a lot of stuff about the British, the Brits and, Mm -hmm. you know, European history. I would like to see that happen on the same, with the same sort of sophistication, budget, maturity level. And I'd love to helm a project like that, where you tell a really epic story in, you know, six to eight episodes and you get to actually have the ability to tell that story the way you want to do it. So I think those are like future goals, like career goals for sure. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, that, that sounds great. Let us know when, <laughs> when yeah, those I'll projects come up. <laughs> keep you posted. If you need anyone, you know you have friends in the Creek cast, so... I know. <laughs> I know, I feel very lucky. <laughs> um, so, obviously, you, you've clearly shown that you've had a lot of experience and you've you've dealt with a lot of things through through the film industry done a lot of projects and obviously also looking forward to many more projects in the future so if you could give a message kind of to upcoming filmmakers or people who are really passionate about film or telling stories um yeah i mean what would you tell them It's really interesting because this, this question it, it, at different points in your career or life has different answers. And right now, you know, I the advice that, you know, there's the the advice that always comes, which is like, you know, you have to have passion. You have to be able to accept no, don't, you know, like not accept no, but hear no and not accept it. Um, how you have to be able to handle rejection. But right now I would t I would tell someone pace them to pace themselves and And also don't allow anyone to make you feel small or to dream small because, you know, that's their problem. <laughs> you have to <laughs> always dream big um, and trust your instincts. If it doesn't feel, if you don't feel like you're getting a fair deal or you don't feel like someone's really supporting you in the right way, don't ignore that feeling, you know, um, and don't burn out because we need you. So, you know, it can be all consuming the creative process and it's so emotional and you give it everything and it's so passionate and often you're working with no money. Um, yeah. You have to take care of yourself first as well, you know, because if you aren't healthy and happy, you can't go put something positive back into the world. Um, and so you have to find a way, you know, it's, it's saying to have balance is really hard in this industry, but you have to find a way to protect that time for yourself and take care of yourself so that you are able to continuously go back out there and fight those hard battles mm -hmm. um, and, and face that rejection and those no's yeah. and like you, know, you have to be you have to be able to take care of yourself so you can mentally and physically go out and do it again and again and again um, and often with no sleep and with no you know reason yeah. not enough resources to support you so it's um i think the cre creatives are constantly thought of as this well, you know, that never ends, but that's, that's impossible, you know, like, um, everybody needs rest and a chance to regroup and come back. So yeah, um, yeah and don't be afraid to come back the, you know, if, if you from a failure, um, you, you will come back from it. Yeah. You don't yeah. think you will at the time, but you will. So nah. that's a lot of a little advice, but <laughs> <laughs> those <laughs> things are <important> to me. <laughs> so yeah. Now with our final question for everything to rest easy, the the one question we ask all of our guests since last podcast, um, <laughs> what <laughs> mark do you want to leave in this world? I think that the mark that you, you know, for myself personally that I want to leave it on the world is just to know that I didn't hold anything back you know i i genuinely you know every day went and did the best that i could um and i think when you have a child uh there are constantly reminders of that because you can't do it for them but you think about how is it is it adding anything will it add anything to their community to to the world at large will that impact them in any positive way So I think like, you know, that's what keeps me going is that idea that, you know, if you, you're here with a purpose and then when you leave, it's because you, to me, hopefully you fulfilled your purpose. So you have to kind of know that you're, you're doing something that's bigger than you. Um, yeah. So there's no, you can't, you have to let go of ego completely. It's just, how can you be of service? Um, And that's really what it comes down to. So I, to me, it's, you know, at the end of each project, it's like, have I, how have I been of service in some positive way? Yeah. Wow. Great. Let's, uh, novel. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Very <laughs> noble. <Mark> <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, thanks. Thanks, guys. <laughs> These are very thoughtful questions. I feel, uh, yeah, lucky that I got to spend this time. Yeah. With you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's been an honor. It's a been pleasure. a pleasure. Thanks for coming in. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, we can have you on again eventually. Yeah. Someday. Yeah. Thank you. I'm gonna. I've got some goals I, I've set on this on this podcast. On the record, not just in my head. So. <laughs> so yeah, really happy you could make it. Yeah. Uh, we'll um, keep in touch. Uh, for all the listeners, thanks for giving in a listen and tuning in. Remember to follow us at the underscore crickets to follow our Instagram page and get all the news about new features, new episodes, and maybe merch. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, also listen or well, watch all of um, the emissions projects. Um, they're on the internet. And as she mentioned, um, you, you can tell that these are all very different projects to many things that you're probably watching on your free time or rewatching like Rick and Morty or The Office. So <laughs> go go check out these projects and help out a bit. And yeah, it's it's been a pleasure and an honor, Nibisha. Thank you so much. So yeah. Stay safe out there. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks. Bye.